All right. Now, can you see my screen? Can you even see my pointer? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Great. So the goal is to talk about how to present, and this is going to be applying to uh, how to organize your own papers and final reports, but also your thesis and various papers that you will publish through your career, how to design your figures, uh, both for your final presentation and for your projects, uh, project reports and oral presentations. And number three, how to actually deliver your old presentations. So um, these are the folks that uh, I, I'm uh, stealing slides from. And I helped teach uh, at 68 last spring by, with Tony. So uh, the last part will be uh, largely focused on that. All right, so what are the key ideas for how to present? So this is a, you know, a lot of advice is on the web. So I encourage you to uh, search for them. And this is one of the presentations by uh, Simon uh, over at Microsoft Research. So basically, uh, the key ideas is number one, don't wait uh, right, right away. So most people say, oh, great, you have an idea. Then you go off and do a bunch of research and you gather data over the span of one year, two years, or three years. And then eventually, you just sit down and, and you write the paper. So what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that uh, sometimes you basically realize only after the fact that a lot of the things that you were doing were in fact a tangent and you resurface after two months of you know doing research and you realize wow none of that stuff will actually make it into the paper and now that i'm writing my paper i realize that there's a flow that is missing a uh, connection that will require that i do some other research here and then you go off and spend you know the next week actually doing that research and as you're writing you realize that between section four and five you should have actually asked another scientific question so then you go off and spend another week of research doing that. The recommendation here is to flip it around, to basically have the idea <laughs> and then immediately outline the paper. Just like, you know, right, well, first we're gonna do this, then we're gonna do that, we're gonna do this, and you know, the figures are actually gonna look like this and this and this and that. What's the, uh, what's the advantage of that approach? The advantage is that it forces you to be clear and focused and only carry out the research that you will actually need that you actually you know, need to take care of. It crystallizes what you don't understand and you can focus most of your energy there and it opens the way to a dialogue with others and you can check, critique and collaborate. So basically the, the, the key concept here is that writing the papers is actually the mechanism for doing research, not just for reporting your research. And that's something that I really encourage you to do. So basically you still have a few weeks before your final projects are due. Right now, right, a couple of weeks, <laughs> A week and a half, maybe 10 days. So write the uh, outline now of what your final report will actually look like. Put together placeholders for all the figures. Label your axes. Draw a you know, sketch for what the you know, relationships might look like. And then go and actually finish the research for that. The second is uh, focus on the key idea. Basically some reusable insight that's useful to the reader. The paper should have one key ping, one clear, sharp idea. You may not know exactly what that is when you start writing, but you can still put a title in your paper even before. And eventually the key finding will, you know, sort of replace that temporary title. And you should know that idea when you finish that paper, you should know what it was. And if you have lots of ideas, you can just split, split them into lots of papers. Don't just write, you know, um, a paper with two ideas because then they're going to be competing with each other. Half the people will hate it for the one they don't care about and the other half of the people will hate you for the, the other thing they don't care about. Um, and many papers contain good ideas, but they do not distill what they are. So basically make certain that your reader is in no doubt what your, your key idea is and be 100% explicit. The main idea of this paper is, in this section we present the main contributions of the paper, etc. So then flow and narrative. Basically your paper should have, you know, um, a, a progression of detail as you go through. And your title will be read by thousands of people. A lot of people will basically Google your paper, will read the title, and then decide not to move further. And then some people will also read the abstract, and you know they, they will decide not to read, not to go any further. Maybe some of them will read the introduction to decide whether to go further. And then you're stating your problem, and then you start losing readers, and then you state your key idea, and eventually the details, why it's better than related work, etc. You get you know fewer and fewer, fewer readers. So you should basically. Uh, spend time approximately uh, proportional to how many people will be reading each part. So for every hour that you spend working on a paragraph of the detail, you should spend 10 hours on the problem and 100 hours <laughs> on the abstract. 
So um, that because that abstract will be read everywhere, and it, it really should crystallize the key points of the paper and you know sort of serve as both a preview and a summary and a packaging of, of that paper. So the other uh, piece of advice that I always give to people, and this is something that I've actually added to these slides, um, is um, most students are basically taught to write in this way. So every paragraph and every paper and every slide basically starts with the question. We next, we next asked whether, da da da. And then to do this, we gather data and then more methods. We aligned it, we analyzed it, more methods. We plotted it, we found something, we validated it. Uh, and then eventually, after the question and more methods and more methods and more methods, you get to the result. Yes, it worked. Or maybe I, as a reader, after I've invested, I don't know, a good three minutes of my life looking through in great detail what you did in that paragraph and trying to understand it and you know spending all these calories that I've eaten into neuron firing time to sort of figure out what it meant, that I'll figure out actually no, it didn't really work. So at the end of the paragraph, after I've invested myself all these hopes and you know wishes and you know I'm, I care a lot about this problem, the conclusion is like, yeah, we're not really sure it worked, it was worth it. Or maybe I've read three of these paragraphs that sort of it wasn't really worth reading. And on the fourth one, I'm kind of tired and I skipped the ending. And that last sentence said, and thus the meaning of life is, <laughs> and I've now skipped it because you wasted my attention, kind of like the boy that cried wolf on several paragraphs that I wasn't really getting anything out of. And now on the last one, I'm like, uh, you know, there's probably not going to be anything there either. So my advice is to actually completely flip it around and start every paragraph <laughs> with your last sentence. So I've done this with so many of my students, like basically every master student, like when they first give me the first draft, they come to me and they're like, how does it look? I'm like, before reading it, I know that I'm gonna take the last sentence of every, of every paragraph, I'm gonna make it the first and you're gonna like it better. And I did this very recently, like two weeks ago. And the student indeed was like, wow, you're right, this is better. So here's the suggestion. Take all these paragraphs, find your last sentence and put it to the beginning. And of course, rephrase accordingly, but the beginning now says, instead of the question, you say the answer, and this should say answer. We next found that the meaning of life is to love thy neighbor and thy purpose in life, da 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 okay? You now have that out, and you have my attention. Wow, is this really mean the meaning of life? So now I wanna read your paragraph. To do this, we gather data, we aligned it, we analyzed it, we plotted, we found, we validated, and yes, it worked. Or, answer, we next found that the meaning of life was not to gather a lot of money. Methods, answers, etc. Okay, do you guys get this? Does that make sense? So as I'm skimming a paper, I can therefore read take home, take home, take home for every paragraph. And then for all the paragraphs where I kind of like what's in there, or maybe I disagree with your conclusion, or maybe I agree with your conclusion, then I'll actually read all of the details. So you start with the message you get their attention. And if they care, of course, you provide all the details. First in the paragraph itself, but these paragraphs are very short. And if you include dozens of methodological details in every single paragraph, no one will ever make it through the paper because they won't even know what's important. So what you do is that you provide the key details of your method in the main text and all the additional details in the method section and all the additional details beyond that. For example, what version of the genome did I use? What version of you know, PyTorch did I use, et cetera? All of that goes in the supplement. Who's with me so far? Yeah? Who feels that they're learning things? You guys like so far? <laughs> awesome, good. So, so here's one example. Again, I, I sort of you know, picked a random paper that we just recently submitted in BioArchive, and you can sort of read the paragraph. We used a number of distinct tissue categories enriched in each trait, lots of details, to distinguish 303 unifactorial traits 56% with most enriched nodes in only one tissue group, indicating a more constrained set of biological processes involved. Another 146 multifactorial traits were enriched on average, da -da 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 -da, a subset of 92 polyfactorial traits, da -da -da -da. So, you know, I could have spent three or four paragraphs on any one of these sentences by basically saying, we next use the number of tissue categories to distinguish three classes of traits. The first category had more than three, 13 traits, and you know, the, we define those as the da da da, and here are some examples, you know, next sentence. For example, QT interval was enriched in only the heart, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So 
this, in my view, is a better use of your time because you just go straight through and, and you know, we next, we next use the enriched tissues of multifactorial trees to partition their associated SNPs into subgroups, which were enriched in distinct biological pathways, thus revealing distinct processes through which multifactorial traits may act. This could have been the last sentence, but it's now at the beginning. And it includes a combination of analysis of the question, of the you know, way that you defined it, and then the conclusion all in one sentence. And if you don't care more, just go to the next paragraph and so on and so forth. Everybody with me? Awesome. So next is focus on your reader. Focus on conveying the intuition. Because you understand it, you understand what your intuition is because you've worked on it so deeply. And very often we make the mistake of forgetting to actually explain the intuition super, super clearly. And instead we focus on the methodological details, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I have another student to whom I was saying recently, um, so, you know, every time I ask you a question, you say, actually, we, studied this and we analyzed that and we gathered this data and we found that and da, 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 da. and after like two and a half minutes you get to so yes we we did find that <laughs> and i'm like just tell me start with a yes and then i can interpret all the rest in the context of that yes and if some of the things that you say in the meantime disagree with a yes i will be much more primed to catch them and sort of pick them out and then you know sort of evaluate your conclusion based on all of the additional data that you're conveying it's not a movie it's a paper very often we sort of start you know you watch a movie and you don't know what will happen to the movie and you're like wow you know he's now going to the building i wonder if i don't know spider-man will be in the building and then you keep reading and stuff happens and in the end no spider-man was not in the building or spider-man was in the building that's not a movie there's no suspense in a paper, you start with Spider-Man was in there. First line of evidence, you know, the music was not as suspicious. Second line of evidence, the lighting was a little off. Third line of evidence, turns out, da da da. da. Anyway, so it, there's no suspense here. Just say what the darn thing is going to happen in the end. And then from that, you can build the lines of evidence that support it. Okay. In the same way, when you explain the intuition, the most important thing is explain in like English. So many papers are unpenetrable. Instead, explain as if you were speaking to someone using a whiteboard. Basically, very often, like my student will basically sort of explain or write this super long complicated paragraph and I'm like, what do you mean? And then he or she will be like, I mean, da -da 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 -da. I'm like, stop, stop, just record it, right? Like write down exactly what you told me now. And sometimes that's the best thing that should go in the paper. The thing that you explain to your roommate or to your neighbor or to your cousin or to your you know, scientist friend or, or to your non-scientist friend. You convey the intuition as the primary goal, not the secondary goal, not, oh, and you know, now that we found all that, let me tell you the intuition behind what we found, you know, break it down for you. No, 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 start by breaking it down. And then once the reader has the intuition, he or she can follow all of the details, not vice versa. So when my students sort of, gives me all the details before the yes, my brain is sort of in this limbo mode where it hasn't decided which way to interpret all these results. But if he says, I think that it's yes, and here's my evidence, my brain is fixed, and I can then sort of follow each of the intuitions uh, by, you know, sort of much more deeply. Um, and even if the, your reader skips the details, they can still take away something valuable because they, they sort of take the take home. And then of course, they can read the, the, the details and decide that they disagree with the take home, but tell them what the take home is so that nothing is ambiguous as they go through it. So introduce the problem and your idea using examples and only then present the general case. So again, here, I'm immediately sort of saying, you know, unifactorial traits, for example, QT interval in heart, educational attainment in brain, hypothyroidism in immune cells. I'm immediately giving an example. And again, here, waist to hip ratio adjusted for BMI in adipose muscle, kidney, and digestive tissues. So instead of spending a paragraph describing the number of tissues in which a particular GWAS strait is enriched on, um, you basically immediately give the examples. And then the polyfactorial traits, including coronary artery disease with 19 different tissue groups, including liver, heart, adipose, et cetera. So examples are paramount 
and they help convey the intuition so that then they can go through the tables and find the rest. Put your reader first, don't put yourself first. So do not recapitulate your personal journey of discovery. Just because you spent three months researching this and then it didn't pan out and two months researching that and it didn't pan out, they don't need to know. They only have limited time. They have so many papers to read. The road may be soaked with your blood and your sweat and your tears, but that's not interesting to the reader. It's only interesting to you. Instead, choose the most direct route to the, day, to the, to the idea. Okay, so research is convoluted. They don't call it search. They call it research. <laughs> you keep searching and researching and researching. So instead, the way that we describe the papers is what would have been the most direct routes to that if I knew the answer in advance. And in fact, that's actually how we do most of the papers. The first round, we search all over. And then when we're done and we know what the answer is, then it only takes us a few weeks to effectively redo all of the analysis and refine all the paper. And then that's sort of the, the path that we describe. If we, if we had perfect knowledge to start with, this is what we would have done. Everybody with me here? So, and then feedback is extremely important. I, as a student, was extremely embarrassed for anyone to read my work. I'm a perfectionist. I wanted my work to always be perfect. And I was so shy that people would not like it and I would just not share it with anyone until it was perfect. This is totally the wrong approach. You should always get others to read your paper because chances are if you're too embarrassed to show it, <laughs> you're right. And, and deciding that you will share the paper no matter what forces you to just get over that embarrassment and just say, okay, fine, you know, this thing I'm embarrassed about, I'll just fix it and I'll fix that thing as well because I know that I'm sending this to my collaborator on Thursday. So all these things that I'm still sort of iffy about, I'll just resolve them. So experts are good and non-experts are very good. So you should basically have both experts read it, but also non-experts because the experts will have a different set of questions than the non-experts, but both are extremely important. So again, for every paper you write, there's a tiny number of people who fully understand it. Tiny, 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 tiny. And the further you go in your career, the more true that is. But you can't have only those people reading your papers. You have to have a much broader uh, audience. You know, for the paper to be cited more than 100 times, you have to find more than 100 experts. And after you run through the 100th expert, by then the people are no longer as closely connected to your field as you are, obviously. And therefore, they will need more intuition. They will need more help. So you have to actually deal with the fact that there will be plenty of non-experts reading your papers. So every reader can only read your paper for the first time once. So use them carefully, explain carefully what you want. You know, I got lost in here is much more important than, you know, uh, this thing is misspelled. So basically do your typos fixing, you know, yourself, you know, run Grammarly or spell checker, you name it. And then after that, make sure that it looks great to, you know, the next person who reads it. Because basically when my students come to me and there's typos everywhere, I'm stuck on the typos. It's very difficult for someone to, to just read past your typos. And the reason for that is that it shows that you don't care. <laughs> if you haven't bothered rereading the paper and fixing the typos yourself, is this the best use of my time? No. After you think that it's ready to be shared, that's when I'm ready to read it. And, you know, sometimes for some papers, this is when the student feels that, oh, it's, it's you know, ready to submit. I mean, we've had dozens of research meetings. Now they're like, okay, I have a submittable version. I'm like, Awesome. Let me now start doing this word level editing. Whereas before it's like, you know, every time I have a comment, they're like, ah, actually, this is a, still a draft. So I'm not really sure you should be reading this. I'm like, yeah, then well, give it to me when you're ready. So get your paper read by as many friendly folks as possible because you want them to give you feedback before, you know, your competitors start reading the paper. That's also good. And you should also get expert help. A good plan is when you think you're done, send the draft to the competition saying, could you help me ensure that I describe your work fairly? <laughs> this is a little funny, right? You know, why would the competition want to read your paper? Well, first of all, they will, you know, sort of make sure that their work is cited correctly, but then they will actually give you feedback. They will sort of, you know, and, and if you're not shy of doing that, then why put it on by your archive or why post it in, you know, a journal and then get their feedback. No, do it right away. They are probably, your competition is probably the people who will care about your paper the most and will read it most closely. And very often they'll respond with helpful critique because they're actually interested in the area. And they'll say, well, I'm not sure you're representing this correctly. 
or you know you're wrong about the way that you're explaining the field and and this is actually the most useful advice before you revise your paper so they're likely to be your referees anyway so getting their comments and criticism up front is really nice okay everybody with me so far so again after you receive the feedback you actually have to incorporate it so read every criticism as a positive suggestion for something you should explain more clearly okay there's plenty of nasty people out there basically you know, sometimes they'll say, oh, this paper's complete crap. And don't focus on that. Focus on the evidence that they're giving to support the complete crap. Have a mental translator that translates nasty comments into nice comments, like, wow, this is such a great paper. However, I would. <laughs> and then it's so much more easy to sort of incorporate feedback. And don't respond with, ah, you just don't get it. I actually meant this. Say, oops. I misspoke. So every time I ask a student a question and they ask me, uh, you know, something that shows that they haven't understood anything I said, it's not their fault. It's entirely my fault. So basically, chances are that if the reader misunderstood the paper, it's not the reader's fault. It's really the author's fault. So instead, you should fix the paper so that X is apparent, even to the either inadvertently or on purpose, you know, uh, most uh, thick reader. So if it can't penetrate the thickest reader, then it's your fault still. And then thank them warmly because they've given their time for you. So even to your nastiest critic, you should say, thank you, this actually helped improve my paper. Again, do the mental translation of, you know, uh, this paper sucks, here's the reasons, into, wow, what a great effort. Here's the reasons why, you know, here's the ways that it could be improved, okay? I, I always like to say, if you know who you are, what they say, tells you more about them than it tells you about you. So even if some person says, oh, this paper is stupid, you know where you stand. This only says something about either their manners or their taste or their understanding or something. But every specific comment that they make is something you should be improving on. So every X uh, should be clear and every specific criticism should be incorporated, okay? The other thing, and I don't know who in the science world does that, but every single scientific paper, when a student first comes to you know, my group, <laughs> writes, it can be seen that 34 tests were run, these properties were thought desirable, it might be thought that this would be a ta da 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 <laughs> This is crazy, why does everybody do that? Instead, we can see that, we ran 34 tests, we wanted to retain these properties, you might think this would be a type of uh, two error, but ta da 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 So just make it active, use the active voice for everything. The passive voice is respectable, but it deadens your paper. Avoid it at all costs. Everybody with me? So, use simple and direct language. Instead of, the object under study was displaced horizontally. <laughs> just say the, boo, the ball moved sideways. On an annual basis, just say yearly. Endeavor us to ascertain. We next saw to find out. It could be considered that the speed of storage reclamation left something to be desired desired the garbage collector was really slow okay so just speak english nobody you know nobody wants to read this everybody thinks that when you speak to your, your research advisor on a casual basis you speak like this and when you write to the scientific literature you write like that no that that's ridiculous no you write like this if you want people to actually understand you okay if you're a lawyer it's a whole other ball game that's fine they're not writing to be understood they're writing to be you know parsed by machines but if you're any other kind of profession this is how you want to be writing everybody with me all right who feels that they've learned stuff so far yes raise your hands awesome all right so now let's dive into figures so um you know these are um you know in some uh, order but basically one of the things that i always ask people to do is label your axis with not just count. Basically, very often I, I see a student who basically brings me a paper that says count on the x-axis and p-value on the y-axis. Is it about fish jumping in the water? Is it about UFOs traversing the universe? Is it about the number of molecules in a typical cell? I have no idea. Instead, label the x-axis number of salmon with you know esoterically long pink tails or something. That's okay. It's still a count. Anybody can see the numbers two, five, seven, et cetera. I mean, that's a count clearly. But if you label number of enhancers, 
And then on the y-axis, num or, num or, or sorry, on the x-axis, number of enhancers showing differential enrichment. I'm like, ah, instead of just number or count. And on the y-axis, it used to say log p-value, log 10 p-value. In my view, log 10 p-value is a metric. Meters is a unit. Log 10 p-value is a unit. What it actually measures is what matters, not the unit in which you're measuring it. I don't care if you're measuring in miles, in feet, or in kilometers, or in you know, uh, astronomical units. All I care about is what you're measuring. And what you're measuring is what you should be writing. I don't care that it's a p-value. I, I care that it's the T2D association, the association with type 2 diabetes. Parenthesis, log 10 p-value. Is everybody clear between what you're measuring and how you're measuring it? Very often, people label their axis with the unit, like feet. Like, I don't care about your unit. What I care about is the thing that you're measuring. Raise your hands if you're with me on this concept. Yes? Awesome. Very cool. So, <laughs> and you can go overboard. For example, here, I could, I could have just not labeled anything, or I could have said enhancers. Instead, I say active enhancers across 833 reference epigenomes. I'm being super explicit about what we're seeing. And on the y-axis, <laughs> I could have just said trait, right? Trait would have been a fine label, or not labeling at all it would have been fine too, because all of these are traits. But instead, this is just going over the top. Are you ready? Reported, trait-associated, lead, single nucleotide polymorphism <laughs> across 534 genome-wide association studies, only 100 representative traits shown using a bag of words approach. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's obvious that it's straight. I didn't even have to write anything. But by putting it there, I'm basically being super explicit about what's being shown. Again, here I could have said number. And in the ledger, you could have said, on the right, we show ta da da. Instead, it's number of enriched tissues. Okay? Here's another thing about the axis 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, et cetera. This is obviously numbers. And the progression is obviously log scale. Everybody with me? But most people will write one, two, three, four, five, or two to the one, two to the two, two to the four, two to the you know, five, et cetera. I find both unnecessary. Just show a log axis, show a log scale, and just write the actual numbers. Very often people are like, minus log two p-value for fold change. To me, it's much more intuitive to know that something changed twofold than something that changed, I don't know, 0.3 on some log axis. Everybody with me here? So label your axis in the most intuitive way and then just say number of enriched tissues, log scale. And, uh, you know, same thing here. So instead of sort of in the legend somewhere hidden explaining what these colors mean, just I write trait complexity classification, polyfactorial, multifactorial, unifactorial. Again, this picture is no example. There's a ridiculous number of data points in this figure. So this is overwhelming amount of information, but it sort of highlights that you have space, use it wisely. And again, GWAS tissue enrichment, minor log, log 10, ta -da -da, you know, the color. I, I always like to create visual legends so that you never have to actually go and read the text of the legend. Just like I tell my students, not every figure should speak for itself, every figure should sing for itself. And then the legend, you know, details and all the methods, of course, you know, if you want to replicate the results, if you want to, you know, rerun the code, if you want to base a paper on it, of course, you'll be reading all of them. Everybody with me? Here's another example of legends that sort of speak for themselves. So here, um, we want to know how many traits were captured by our new project, which is the red one. And then how many were captured only by our new project? and how many were captured by combination of the new project and some other uh, project. So we just label those bars red. And you just say uniquely captured by new reference epigenomes, n equals 116, which is the sum of those two. Don't let the readers do math. They're having you know, hard enough work understanding your paper. You know, they've already passed high school. They don't need to do addition anymore. You're not testing them. Just give the answers for them. n equals 116, which is the sum of those numbers, and that's fine. And again, the sum of these numbers, not only I write the legend, moreover, I just write these numbers. Because nobody wants to be doing, well, I wonder, this is you know, slightly to the left of 400, it must be you know, this number, et cetera, okay? And then here, FDR level, just labeled in the shading. Here, um, you know, as you're increasing, instead of saying cumulative number, 
is a cumulative number of GWAS traits captured by increasing number of epigenomes showing significant tra tissue trait enrichment. Okay, every single time you speak, you, you know, you let the figures uh, sing for themselves. And then when you actually read the legend, that's a whole other exercise. So, for example, the legend for panel C could have basically said, on the y-axis, we show ta da da On the x-axis, we show ta da da On the, you know, below, we show ta da da et cetera. Instead, it says, number of traits with significant GWAS trait enrichment for each combination of projects. Okay? So, it's a sentence. It's a single sentence. But within that sentence, with parentheses, I basically explain everything you need to know about the axis which you're showing, et cetera. Number of traits, y-axis. Good. Got it with significant GWAS trait tissue enrichment for each combination columns, oh cool, every column shows a combination, of projects, rows. Okay, sounds good? So basically deciphering the legend is, you know, using a very, very small number of words. I could have used a ton of words to basically describe all the stuff that I'm putting directly into the legend. I'm basically saying number of traits captured by each combination of projects, in the legend, in, in the sort of visual legend. And then the legend itself can be super thin. Everybody with me? So instead of saying the x-axis shows, just write a sentence that describes, describing what you're, what you're finding, what the take home is, and then just use parentheses to label each of those different uh, things. Here's another example where you're, you know, using visually the figure itself to basically get an intuitive uh, read through. Okay, so for example here, this is all about how a motif is responsible for this peak in this chromatin uh, profile. So basically what you see here is a bunch of different uh, cell types, the chromatin state annotations, and you're zooming in here. And then you're zooming out and you, you, know, you basically have a legend of where you are in the chromosome. You only have the major tick marks and you have the gene name so you can look it up super quickly. You don't have to overclutter your figure with all of this extraneous information. Over here, I basically write exactly what that histone modification mark is. And as you zoom in, you basically see this dip in the chromatin profile. And then I zoom into the dip. So something must be happening to displace nucleosomes at the center here. What is that something? Well, we tile it with different experiments. So region tiled, I basically give exactly the coordinates, selected in FG2, high dip score, and then 432 reporter measurements in HEPG2, nine tile offsets times 24 barcodes times two replicates. I could have just not included a legend at all, but instead I'm explaining everything visually so that the reader can sort of get it just by staring. And this is tile number one, number two, number three, number four, got it. So I'm only labeling the things that actually matter. Instead of having one, two, three, four, I have tile number four here. So we've basically tiled this region a bunch of different ways. 48 different barcode measurements, 24 in each replicate, see panel D, and panel D has exactly the data for this. And then here, you basically see, aha, that's where the motif is. And in fact, you're showing the exact sequence here and here with dot, dot, and here, et cetera. So you basically are deconstructing the figure in a highly intuitive way with a minimum amount of ink. Every single time you plot a figure, you should think that in ancient Pompeii, someone would have had to carve this into marble, okay? So just think about the number of, you know, uh, hammer taps that you need in order to create thousands of tick marks and just get rid of them and only plot the things that are really, really necessary. So paint is expensive, you know, marble is expensive, the artist time to sort of chop the marble is expensive. Just minimize all that and only show the things that are visually most crucial to show. Otherwise, your image is cluttered. Everybody with me? Um, again, you can see here this figure in context. It says here, see panel D. What's in panel D? Panel D are the individual measurements. And notice how all of this is completely connected to each other. Here, tile number five is in red. This is the actual example for tile number five. And then this is the actual example for tile number four. So these are the measurements of hundreds of data points, two of which are in fact those two tiles. And then here again, I'm using the exact same uh, example. Example in C comma D, 
replicate two versus replicate one. Example in sigma D, replicate one. Uh, so tile five versus tile number four. So you know the figures are sort of calling on top of each other, onto each other, as opposed to sort of showing a different example here, a different example there, a different example there. By labeling this one point, I'm giving intuition as to what are we measuring. And then this is comparing two tiles at the same offset. This is comparing two tiles at different offsets. And you can see here, tile number four versus tile number five, the colors are exactly the same. And the colors here are exactly the same uh, as there. So you can actually find the call out. Sounds good? So it's kind of fun to do that. It's a, sort of you're, you're, you're constantly thinking, how can I make the figures as intuitive? And this is not simple stuff. It's complicated stuff. But you're making the figures as intuitive as possible. For example, here, replicate comparison, same tile. Consecutive tile comparison, same replicate, and so on and so forth. Here's another example where in panel A, you show some examples. Actually, in the first figure of this paper, there's the actual alignments that are shown here in yellow highlights. And then in the first figure of the, in the, in the first panel, the second figure, you basically have those corresponding regions. And then you basically show how they fall in that distribution. You then show with the same exact axis across the three figures, how these three points are now falling onto a different plot and a different plot. And then the axis again, the same on this one, so I can trace these across. And then the cutoff that I'm showing here in orange is also shown here in orange and here in orange and here in the other orange and so on and so forth. Okay, so you can actually use this for you know, the readers truly deeply understand each of the figures, okay? And this is about overlapping constraints in the human genome. We are now submitting a paper, hopefully in the next few days, about overlapping constraints in the coronavirus genome. So it's kind of fun. Uh, anyway, so how do you design more? So these are just some examples from my own research uh, and, you know, from my group's work and sort of how my students, you know, <laughs> what, what they poor people have to put up every time they show me a figure. This is now the examples from Ayora Zabala from um, Cancer Research UK about designing more effective scientific figures. So she's basically structured it into theory, practical, and then you know what you're like, how to deal with all these uh, different uh, topics, okay? So the take homes are uh, number one, we're gonna look at the key figure and legend advice, and then that's what we already did actually. Then we're gonna go through her slides and look at the elements of a figure marks and channels, the visual channels, then how to choose the right type of figure, how to deal with complexity, advice on typography, and then advice on uh, composition and layout, and then general tips. So let's just dive right in, elements. So these are the marks. These are the geometric primitives which are used to represent data. These primitives are points, lines, areas, and then the channels control the graphical appearance of these marks, and they're used to encode data, and they can be combined. You can encode something based on its horizontal position, based on its vertical position, based on both horizontal and vertical, based on color, based on shape, based on the tilt, based on the size, basically whether something is small or, or long. And that size could be unidimensional with length, two-dimensional with area, or three-dimensional with volume. And humans are actually good at interpreting different aspects. We're kind of bad about interpreting height, but we're very good about interpreting, sorry, vertical position, but we're very good about interpreting horizontal position. We're not very good about interpreting shades. We're not very good about interpreting areas or volumes, God forbid, or tilt, my oh my. And uh, we're, we're kind of bad at sort of capturing all of these different shapes. We're much easier at distinguishing points by color and then if you want yet a fourth dimension to your plot or a fifth dimension, you can then add points of different shapes. But these are the tools at your disposal. If you can you know, draw points or lines or areas and then put them in different places or shapes or colors or uh, et cetera. Everybody with me here on the primitives? Yep. So then you have different channels of information. So basically you can identify the channel based on categorical or qualitative attributes, for example, the position on a common scale, or the length, or the tilt, or the area, or the color luminance, or the color saturation. So these are two different dimensions that you can show uh, for the same uh, uh, channel. 
and then hue could denote one thing, while saturation could denote another thing. And then again, the spatial region, the shape, the volume. So these are magnitude channels. They're ordered uh, based on quantitative uh, attributes. And then uh, you can sort of denote something based on the shape, based on the size, based on the orientation. You can vary the weight. You can vary the position. You can vary the color. And you can sort of get people to pay attention to different things you know, using all these different channels. And if your, the orientation is just getting the figure for something and want to highlight something else, you can use color or you can use you know, weight and so on and so forth to highlight things. So you can use orthogonal channels that are not already used in your figure. And if you look at the perceived magnitude of sensory channels, it actually follows a power law. Depending on the end of a given type of sensation, its perception is magnified, for example, color saturation, or compressed, for example, the brightness. And if you look at what is the physical intensity versus the perceived sensation, <laughs> with just a little bit of electric shock, you can get a lot of sensation. So, you know, that's the advantage of reading papers online. You can actually hook people up to your electric shocker. And, you know, when they're reading a particular sentence based on tracking their eyes, you can just shock them this well remember. Mm -hmm. But we mostly don't use that. Saturation is the next best thing without sort of getting into jail for shocking your readers. Uh, and then length, area, depth, and brightness. So our eye naturally corrects for brightness. So we are trained throughout our life to erase it out. When you walk into a white room, nothing is white. Everything is shades of gray. And, you know, just <laughs> look at the walls around you. You will notice that the closer you get to the corners, the darker they get. This is basically something that our brain is naturally erasing. Don't expect the reader to take something that the brain naturally erases and then you know, perceive it to understand a paper. Instead, give them stuff that they are very good at. Everybody with me so far? So let's now choose the right type of figure. So should I use text? Should I use a table or a figure? If it's one or two numbers, just use the text. Parentheses will do fine. If you have exact numerical values, then you can use a table. With small data sets, a figure may be best avoided if it has low area density. For example, here, you know, one, two, three, da 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 I'm basically wasting all of this to effectively write three numbers that occur just written in text, okay? The figures I showed you had a huge amount of information content. Here, you're storing two, uh, I mean, three floats with two-digit precision, okay? Not, not the best use of space. So when the data presentation requires many localized comparisons, that's really the best place to put uh, graphs. So here's the things you can illustrate. You can basically illustrate the relationship over time of how something grows. You can illustrate the comparison between two classes. You can look at the composition and the separation between different classes. You can illustrate distributions. And every figure tells a different story. This is exactly the same data, but you know, in this way, you constantly see the comparison between these two groups. In this way, you focus more on the progression over time and their similarity. In this way, you can basically show the, uh, you know, very small change based on the x-axis being at zero. And here, you could amplify that change by truncating the axis or showing relative change or something. So again, you know, you can lie with figures by sort of truncating it here. But in fact, by putting the zero there, then the reader realizes, oh, yeah, that's not a big difference. And same thing here. By, by sort of showing that, everybody focuses on just the relative change. And they're like, wow, this one went way up higher than that one. And this one went way lower. But in fact, when you plot it this way, you're like, well, no, the difference is actually fairly small compared to the overall change. Okay? So remember that you're choosing what story to say. You have to be honest with your data. And the way to, to be honest with your data is sort of make sure that you're using the right type of graph to illustrate the right type of value change, okay? So here, for example, you could be seeing how, you know, these values change over time, or <laughs> this is a figure from actually uh, a published journal where you basically truncate the data 58 to 70. Wow, this has dramatically turned Republican. Well, it turns out that no, this is like basically in the error, okay? Everybody with me so far? You can also uh, you know, compare different things with the strip chart. For example, only one of the axes here is meaningful. On the, 
uh, x-axis, we're using something known as dithering, where you're basically just putting the points away from each other so that we can recognize different points from each other, but actually show individual points where only one dimension matters. And here we're showing the different doses, but within this, the difference doesn't actually matter. And this is very helpful to explore small data sets and to compare categories. And this is one of the most basic plots, but it's actually rarely used in publications. So it's actually a very, very helpful plot. Instead of showing a bar chart with whisk box and whiskers, you know, you're sort of hiding all this information. Whereas you can actually show the individual points and then the reader can basically say, wow, there's a group here, there's an outlier there, the means appear to be different, and here the means of each point are shown, the distribution of each point is showed, but also the full uh, individual set of points are shown. Everybody with me here? So uh, with a line chart, you can basically show relationships. You want to show a trend of continuous data, usually over time, for matched pairs or repeated data sets and for time series. And here you say a story, how the data changes rather than the discrete values of the data. So for example, if you want to emphasize the delta, you can sort of you know, show the axis here if that's the main thing that you're trying to emphasize. You can show uh, box and whiskers plots. You can show, use both color and uh, difference. So you can show you know, um, one as a dotted line or as a grayscale, et cetera. If you're giving a background, for example, plot the background in gray and put the foreground in a color. Uh, same thing with disease, non-disease. Very often I tell my students, well, use blue for healthy and use red for disease. You know, don't and, and keep, stay consistent. And then if you're showing relative to something, then put that something in a more subsued and then you show the relative this way. And if it was a drop instead, you would have shown the gray up here and then the drop in black or something like that because our mind naturally looks at the more salient thing as the one that is being plotted and then the less salient as the background to which we should compare that. So again, a bar chart uh, is used for comparing discrete quantities of non-continuous data, so for presenting results and emphasizing differences, but not so much for exploring data. So again, uh, you could show a bar chart this way with truncated axis, very misleading, or you could show the actual axis uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, you can also uh, plot the log for ratios. That's extremely important because it's symmetrical. So if something drops by 50% or increases by 50% uh, with the log, you can actually show these changes in symmetric fashion. Whereas if you plot the ratio in a linear scale, that increase here looks way, way bigger than that decrease here, when in fact in log space, they're exactly the same. So the choice of the x-axis and the choice of the point of reference can very greatly affect how the comparisons are perceived. Everybody with me on this one? So you can actually uh, do variations on the on this, uh, uh, bar chart. You can basically show a stacked bar chart that basically shows the total count for different uh, categories and the subdivisions within these categories. So at a glance here, you can see that this category is bigger and that category is smaller, and then you can focus within the categories to look at the difference between them. Or if you want to emphasize the within category variation, you can basically make them all out of 100% frequency and then show the relative changes. And then suddenly your eye focuses on this as opposed to the absolute, which basically your eye focuses on the big uh, plots. Everybody with me here? Yes? So pie charts are used to show relative proportions of a whole, but they're usually a terrible idea because they have very low data density they fail, they fail to order the numbers along a visual dimension. So for example, here, at a glance, I can see which category is bigger. Here, it's very difficult. I don't know if this one's bigger or that one. And also to compare this one, I have to compare the height of this one to the length of that one. And our brain's generally not very good about gauging areas. Like basically, you know, is this, I don't know, 10 times bigger than that or five times bigger than that? It's unclear. Um, instead, you could use something like this, which basically shows you know, proportions and, uh, you know, scales at the same time uh, in a sort of common setting. Or you could use bar charts uh, and, you know, you can look more into other area uh, charts. So this is a dot chart with confidence interval. Basically, it focuses the attention on relative values and their measure of variability rather than on the absolute values. Absolute values are better conveyed using the heights in a bar plot, whereas relative values, when you're comparing categories, 
are better compared with uh, you know showing the the mean and the, uh, the standard deviation or the standard errors or some confidence interval or uh, uh, quantiles and uh, you know this is uh, better for that. Histograms are useful for showing distribution, so to show the distribution of a variable and the relative frequency of values, and also to explore the data. It's better on big data sets, you can estimate the probability distribution of the variable, and the number of bins resolution affects the perceived shape of the distribution, and the same perceived uh, perceptive distortion can occur when using histograms with discrete data. And then a good rule of thumb is the number of intervals should basically be the square root of your data points and the interval width should roughly be the range divided by that square root of n. You can show either an ordinary histogram where you're showing the PDF or a cumulative CDF, um, the probability density function, the cumulative density function for uh, showing how these numbers change. Um, another thing that you should realize is that in a histogram, you have to choose the bin size, but with a cumulative distribution, you don't have to choose the bin size you could actually show every single data point here with every single data point increasing your bar in a continuous fashion. And then if you want to show the delta of this interval to that interval, you just choose this point in your graph and that point in your graph and the difference between them, you could plot an arrow and then actually write out the numbers of that difference. So, you know, cumulative distributions are extremely powerful in being able to show points that might be extremely sparse from each other but then hugely concentrated in one tiny little plot that would have been missed if we were uh, just looking at the PDF because then you have to choose intervals and only show within these intervals. So a box plot is very helpful for showing distributions, also box and whisker plots. Uh, so this is you know, the boxes and these are the whiskers. And this is you know, an alternative uh, distribution which actually shows the actual distribution. So this shows the central value, the extremes, and the area where 50% of the values are located. So this is the interquartile uh, range. So basically this is one quarter of the data, one quarter of the data, and then you know the second and the third quarters are here. And you can also show individual outliers, which are above uh, you know, this particular cutoff. Okay? So usually you show the median, the minimum, the maximum, the lowest, and the highest quartiles. And this is particularly useful to understand the distribution of non-normal data. Everybody with me on this one? You can do vari variations on that. For example, a violin plot, basically kind of like shaped like a violin, is basically um, adding uh, to that by showing the actual distribution. On top of that, you could actually show the strip chart with the individual data points. So you could actually you know, show every tick mark here is the data point. You could also offset them to show the individual di different dots because right now you're using this entire you know, picture of the poor, the poor guy in Pompeii having to carve every single one of these lines. Instead, you could be placing dots, and then you know you'd, you'd be using a lot more uh, information. And again, the data density here is mirrored by the shape of the polygon. Everybody with me on the violin plots and the bean plots? So a scatter plot is very helpful for showing the relationships between continuous variables. So basically, you know, if you're comparing this particular microRNA to I don't know some other snoRNA binding, you can basically say, "Wow, these guys are consistently above the diagonal." Uh, but you can also show that in the context of all of the other data, basically say, well, here's what the distribution normally looks like, and these are the points that I chose to highlight, and you can kind of see whether they're outliers or not, and so on and so forth. So uh, this is uh, great for uh, when you have, I don't know, hundreds to thousands of points, but if you have tens of thousands of points, it saturates. So you have no idea what's going on here. Is the distribution mostly here? Is it mostly here? Is it mostly flat? And that's where uh, smooth density color representation can actually be very helpful. So here you're seeing every single individual dot, every single data point. And here you can see that there are hundreds and thousands of data points at the very center. And you can see where the distribution sits. You can do variations on the scatter plot where you can basically add a third dimension with the size of the bubble that basically shows, you know, um, additional information that you might want to show. You can use color as a nut and additional dimension above that. So here you have one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions with the size, four dimensions with a color, and so on and so forth. Okay? And because of the transparency, you can kind of see those uh, plots regardless. 
you can do variations on the scatter plot where here, notice the same trick that I was highlighting earlier where you can project down this distribution of points and you get this scatter plot of, sorry, this uh, histogram of data. You can again project this uh, scatter plot and you get the distribution here. And if you project things this way, you get you know, another distribution. And you can have the p values above the diagonal, or you know, I usually would have put them as little fonts here so that everything is where you need it to be rather than sort of having to trace things across and then the significance. So this is a corelogram, which is very helpful for exploring bivariate associations in a very large data set. A heat map is helpful for showing relationships. It shows more complex relationships, for example, more many conditions. Uh, you have to normalize and you have to cluster, otherwise the heat map can be meaningless. But after you cluster it, you can kind of see that, well, this group here appears to be a separate cluster, and these two appear to be separate conditions, for example, and so on and so forth. So you can represent things with color, and you can uh, use uh, filtering. The heat map is basically a table with colors instead of the numbers. So basically, if you're looking at Excel, these are the actual numbers, and then you can sort of choose to color it. And you can also color the, uh, basically, you can provide a color key and a, and a histogram of how many values are at each point on that key. So this basically shows the PDF, uh, the probability density function, uh, along with that distribution of values. So you could also cluster to uh, highlight the differences between the values. So rather than sort of having something like this, you can sort of reorder the columns and the rows to basically better show the structure. And you have to be careful with clustering because uh, you know, if you're removing unchanging points, you focus on the differences, then it might be misleadingly think, you know, leading you to think that the differences are in fact much bigger. So for maps, when information is shown in a map directly, it has much more information power. And you can see here the density of each different county and you know, the corresponding scales. But then the, the challenge of that is that the geographical area doesn't necessarily represent population density. Instead, you could use uh, little squares where every single square represents the exact same population uh, amount. And then um, sort of you can better see what that distribution looks like. Right now, it looks like a lot of blue and very little red, when in fact, when you do that, you see that there's a lot more uh, red. And you, know, you should always think, what is the message that you're trying to emphasize? Is it geographical distribution or is it proportions of different classes? So this is <laughs> basically one way of navigating all this. Uh, what would you like to show? Is it a comparison, a distribution, a composition, or a relationship? Is it two variables or three variables? Then choose this chart. Is it a comparison among items or over time? Over time, you basically use these types of charts. Among items, is it two variables per item? Is it one variable per item? Many categories, few categories, few items, etc. Uh, and then is it a distribution across a single variable, two variables, three variables? Is it a static composition as a simple share of the total? or an accumulation, or a component of components, where you can basically see these stacked uh, charts, and then you can see sort of how they're uh, branching out over here. Uh, is it a change over time, over few periods, or many periods, or where only the relative differences matter, or the relative and the absolute matter, or only the relative, and so on and so forth. And again, be creative, be intuitive, think about sort of the, this relationship and engaging uh, each reader's intuition uh, to best you can. So to summarize, these are the different types of plots, these are the different types of aims, and these are the main functions that you can use in R to plot those. Who feels that they've learned stuff? Yes, raise your hands, good. Um, all right, so now how do we deal with complexity? So you can focus the viewer's attention onto the main point you want to convey, for example, on specific subsets of the data, and the goal is to require less cognitive load for the viewer to understand the message. Again, they've already passed all the tests they should pass. You're not testing them anymore. You're really just trying to convey information to them. So how do you do that? For example, one way might be to group things. Instead of showing you know, nine bars this way, when in fact there are three groups of three, you're kind of lost here. You can't even tell how many there are. But by grouping them, you're like, aha, there are two, three, you know, three groups of three. And then you could also order them. So for example, if I'm showing a, you know, a bunch of different categories on the x-axis and 
you know, they're changing this particular fashion, this doesn't make it very easy because, you know, uh, if you order them instead, you can basically read them in order and know that this is growing and growing and growing and growing and there's a big discontinuity here. So then I can focus on the labels without having to constantly focus on, oh, and is this the third biggest and so on and so forth. Everybody with me on the difference here? Yep. You can also visually cluster the points that you want to convey. So basically I can show this plot here or I can just say, well, you know, these are the two clusters that are emerging and, you know, highlight them better this way. So that can help draw attention to the category that you've chosen. The other thing with grouping, so this is a one dimensional ordering based on the size. Something that I always tell my students to do is to diagonalize their matrices. So if you have a list of enhancer tissues, for example, on the columns and the motifs that are enriched in those different tissues on the rows, if you diagonalize it, it's so much easier to basically say, oh, for heart, these are the motifs, these are their enrichments. For kidney, these are the motifs, these are their enrichments. For muscle, these are the motifs, these are their enrichments, and so on and so forth. And what other things are they enriched in? I can just go through at the off-diagonal entries and sort of figure out what else you know, is missing. So again, showing a huge number of points, and by adding, like, diagonalizing them and sort of drawing these dotted uh, separations, you're effectively grouping them in these two, dimensional, uh, in these two dimensions, and then uh, showing them this way. Notice here, there's a trick that we used in this particular uh, case for the font. We want to basically show the actual uh, transcriptional factor name, the actual motif of the transcriptional factor, and exactly the full information for every motif. How do we do that? Well, we could either make a super tall figure, or we could make the figure twice as uh, short, and instead split the motifs between left and right. So if you care about this one, you can go there, and then see the individual lines explaining what each of those motifs is. Whereas including the legend only on one side would, would have made it much harder and we would have needed a much taller uh, plot. Everybody with me here? Yes? You can also filter, link, and embed. You can basically, for example, highlight this and then zoom it out, to sort of highlight this particular chart among a continuation of charts. <laughs> You clearly don't want to show your data this way. This is just completely incomprehensible. One thing you can do is split them into different distributions. And then you can sort of see the linear trend for each of the different points. Everybody with me here? But again, remember the examples I was showing earlier of reusing the axis across different plots? Instead, you could basically put them all on the same axis. So you're using the exact same space in your figure, but this data is actually legible and this data is completely incomprehensible. You can also look at small multiples, for example, uh, you know, along different dosages. You can sort of see how these things change, or you could sort of zoom it out and zoom back in uh, this way to basically sort of highlight how things are changing uh, with bigger and bigger scales, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is basically how to choose the right figure, how to uh, combine these basic foundational elements, and then how to uh, deal with complexity by grouping things or ordering things. Let's now talk a little bit about typography. So all of the elements need to be labeled. And then the essential criterion for choosing the font is readability, scalability, so that it's readable at small sizes, contrast with the background, so don't choose, I don't know, light blue in light blue. And then the fonts convey uh, personality, mood, or attitude, but some fonts more than others. So, Serif fonts are the ones that have, you know, all the additional little wiggles. And then sans serif, which basically means without in, serif in French, basically means no, no, no frills, just, you know, the most basic piece of information. And sans serif is much easier to read at small sizes. And the size of the font is given in points and it's the size of an imaginary block of metal that is used in printing. Remembering again the guy in Pompeii. Uh, in practice, it's the only way to know exactly how well your font will read in uh, print. So monospace is uh, good if the text is intended to be aligned from line to line, uh, but um, the, you know, it makes it more tidy. But what I don't like is that um, you know, uh, sometimes the gaps are bigger in the middle. Uh, and I much prefer sort of having the lines this way at the end, but that's personal preference. Many of my students sort of space them out. And then I'm like, well, did you make a mistake and you type two spaces after the period? Um, 
or uh, which was recently resolved by Microsoft Word. We only need one space. Um, or uh, is it sort of a type or something? And sort of I prefer sort of equal font, uh, equal spacing with variable uh, lines. So uh, aspect ratio distortions can happen when changing the font size. In Illustrator, there's an option for actually going through and sort of rescaling this to be exactly 100%. Uh, so you should scale the axis using comparable units. You should minimize the text, keep it simple. Right now, it's horrendous. I can't tell what's going on. China is here, for example. But in fact, if I want to compare, I don't know, five different countries that I care about and that I talk about in the text, this is the way to do it. You basically write out the full name. Avoid the use of acronyms. Every acronym decreases your readership by 5%. So, um, you know, just spell things out because uh, chances are that a random reader who wants to see your figure will show up going to figure five. I have no idea what the acronyms mean. Close your paper, move on to the next paper, as opposed to go to figure five, open it, immediately interpret it because your axes make sense because they don't need to read the figure legend. They don't need to read the, uh, the text legend. They don't need to read the text surrounding it, figure out who's referring to that figure, et cetera. And uh, you know, you should think about tracking, leading, and paragraph alignment. Uh, you should typeset blocks of text that are in solid shapes and avoid text that are not in solid shapes. And um, you know, sort of choose numbers that cannot be interpreted as letters and so on and so forth. All right, and then in terms of composition and layouts, uh, you know, you should basically uh, again, in planning your final report, you should sort of sketch out what every figure should look like. What would you like to show and how? And then, you know, create that outline and then build the elements to fill that outline. Uh, grids are basically an invisible structure that allows you to uh, understand the composition of an image. And, you know, they should just be as organized as possible, unless you're doing abstract art, in which case it's fine. And you should also align things as much as possible. Every single major editing software has that. In PowerPoint, you can select everything and then align it. And it also shows you uh, little lines as you're sort of putting things in the same uh, direction. Um, you can basically use grids to sort of organize things nicely. You can balance things visually and hierarchically. You can sort of you know, space them out. You can leave little spaces in between to sort of let the reader breathe. Basically, right now, everything is running to everything else. It's very hard to see. And um, you know you can also realize how the readers are going to be uh, reading your images. So basically, it's clear they go to the most salient first, and then the understanding the context of the second one. So you should also use more white space. So you know this is a little overwhelming. You can use that. You can also go further and remove the axis labels if they're the same. Uh, you know just keep them only here, and so on and so forth. So again, as much as possible, try to minimize cluster. Think of the poor guy carving marbles in Pompeii. So the don'ts are don't distort the data, no unnecessary figures or elements. Do you really need that poor guy to carve all this marble? Do you really need a figure? Do you, you know, would a table suffice? Don't rely absolutely on color. Uh, no 3D, in most cases, it stores perspective. And the do's are one point per figure. Don't try to make many points per figure. Split it up into two figures if you're trying to make two points because one together might not make it well. Summarize to clarify, have a clear purpose, a clear message, and then link to the accompanying text and statistic. So basically, if you're trying to uh, improve this figure, one of the things you could do is lay them out you know, in a great fashion. This is you know, not very pleasant. This is much more pleasant. You can uh, you know, keep improving things by scaling things and you know, sort of moving things in our order. So you should always ask, is your figure effective? Is it self-contained? Is it understandable without adding additional information? Uh, without having to go to the text of the legend, you should have a figure legend, a visual legend. Every element should be labeled or explained in the caption, including X and Y units. The scales should show appropriate variation of the data. The scales should be labeled according to what you're showing, not the metric, but the, the thing that you're showing. And the readability and contrast should be appropriate. Every use of color should have a reason. And the figure should also work in grayscale whenever possible. And you should uh, help with groupings to help understand the message without manipulating. And you should not have any channel inconsistencies and keep it as simple as possible. No decorations. Every piece that could be eliminated without losing information has been eliminated. And this has been validated with other people. 
So in the process, you first collect the data, then you process the data, you fill the data, you filter the data, you clean the data sets, you keep doing exploratory analysis. And then once you have your general conclusions, that's when you draft your figure for illustrative purposes, you sketch it out by hand, you share it with the peers, and then you produce the raw figure, R or Excel or something, explore the data, then you edit the design details, and lastly, at the very end, you export it as a journal-ready figure, minimizing the work that the poor car, uh, marble carver has to do. So always try to validate the plots you create. You've seen your data too often to get an unbiased view. Show the plot to someone not familiar with the data. Does it really, what does it really tell you? Is a message you wanted to convey what they're getting out of it? If they pick multiple points, do they cho you know, choose the most important one first, and so on and so forth. All right, so uh, <clears throat> now we have about uh, oh, uh, 10 minutes for uh, all of 6UAT. <laughs> so it's obviously not gonna happen, but I encourage you to really take that class because it teaches you how to not only write your papers, create your figures and display items, but also deliver them in a memorable fashion. So the organization for the last eight minutes is what is the importance of conveying your work, how to speak clearly, how to plan your talk with storyboarding, signposting, and recovery, how to convince with rhetoric, both effective and efficient, using ethos, pathos, and logos, and how to connect with your audience, achieve your goals, and match them. And then lastly, what is the take home, delivery, recovery, credibility, goals, and visibility. So let's talk about the importance of conveying your work. Technical skills are very often the emphasis, and the presentation skills often lack, and that's why we, you know, the MIT developed 6 u the goal is clarity, persuasion, confidence, integrity, and matching your audience. So if you, my, what I always tell my students is, if people don't understand what you've done, it's as if you didn't do it. They say, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, well, has it really fallen? If you wrote the most awesome paper, but you made it so dense that nobody understands it, or if you have the most awesome final project, and, you know, you present it and people don't understand it, it's as if, you know, did you really do a project? It's as if you hadn't done it, because you're not gonna influence anyone. You're not going to get any citations, and you're not going to get people to really understand it, embrace your results, and use them, and publish on them. So how to speak clearly? So in CTAT, we do a self-introduction video where you worry about your posture, your voice, your rhetoric, your eye contact, your facial expression, the hook you're using to connect with the audience, your flow, your creativity, how to make the best first impression, how to influence your talk perception, and then practice, 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 and then use available resources. So again, uh, you can practice by filming uh, an introductory video to yourself and then evaluate these different criteria of memorability, of hook, retro rhetorical devices, et cetera, and how to avoid poor quality or duration or very low volume or you know, using the wrong you know, tools and so on and so forth. First impressions matter. When you first show up, why have they invited you to give a talk? Maybe it's the company you work for. Maybe it's the reputation, your credentials, the reputation of those who spoke before you. Your speech content is what comes afterwards. So basically, now you've walked in the door, you now have to deliver. So the content of what you're about to say is probably one of the reasons they invited you. But then the delivery of how you say it is what they're going to remember and what you said they're going to remember. And your voice, your volume, your quality, your tone, your attire, did you dress up, your age, your body language, your, bo your poise, your posture your facial expression, your eye contact, your knowledge, all of these things matter well beyond just, you know, uh, the content of your talk. Your confidence, your active listening, the company you keep, how you treat others, your mood, your emotion, the proximity you keep with, you know, different aspects, your, your writing style, your deeds, your handshake. If you let somebody go to the, you know, front of the coffee line, or your humor, your physical attributes, your hygiene, your, you know, uniqueness. So all of these things matter. So you can do different types of um, uh, activities to basically improve on different types of skills. You can do miming and plus cross-lingual communication, play reading, magic or showmanship, where you have a punchline, a visual punchline, or you sort of attract people's attention to the right place, a musical theater, uh, speech reading, storytelling, stand-up comedy, acting, teaches you about eye contact, gestures, how to use space, your facial uh, expression, your body posture, and all of these things matter greatly. How to use silence uh, properly, how to pace yourself, 
how to pause and then make an important point, your expressivity, your, your intonation, the word choice, the volume, how you can fluctuate that volume to convey the importance of different aspects of the talk. So that's the delivery. Then before that, you actually have to worry about the planning, the storyboarding, the signposts, and your recovery. So very often, most stories start with once upon a time, so here you establish the situation. And every day, da -da 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 -da, until one day, that's where the problem arises, the conflict arises. And then from that point, unravels the story. Because of, I don't know, the pirates that arrived on the shore, a bunch of things will happen. And then until finally, that's how you resolve things. And ever since they, you know, that day, you now have the resolution, the new state of affairs. And as a result, and in the end, the moral of the story is. Okay, that's the typical flow. And that works great for many, many stories. And that's awesome, okay? So you should realize that even in writing a paper, sometimes you go through that flow. And even giving a talk, sometimes you go through that flow. But you should also realize that that's not the only flow. For example, you could, in an action movie, basically spend, you know, a uh, different amount of time in different things, in different types of activities. You could also sort of go through and, you know, repeat this way. Or you could actually start you know, somewhere in the middle. And then you could move backward. And then, you know, for example, the Odyssey starts in the middle. And then you go back and you sort of hear about the beginning. And then you still have the cliffhanger and you end here. Or you could just do a flash forward or you could do a flashback. Or you could have, uh, <laughs> I think this might be Memento, where you basically uh, sort of start in the middle and then you go back and forward in color and back in black and white and forward in color and so on and so forth. So anyway. There's all kinds of really cool ways that you could convey a movie. In the same way, scientific talks have storyboards. Many follow the same formulation, but you can be creative about it. Do you want to stand out? Do you want to impress? Or maybe you just want to match the context. Maybe in that context, the linear might not work well. Or you have a specific goal that you're trying to accomplish. Or someone has to leave early, and you want to put that part first. So be flexible. So, you know, one of the exercises in 618 is giving a four-slide talk either this way, which is the typical way. So expanding fuel cell markets using them the technology. Uh, there's many uses and needs. Here's the technology, here's what I did within it, okay? But you could go, you could go many different ways. You could basically say, well, uh, maybe first I'm gonna illustrate the method that I used. So here's the really cool thing that I did last summer. And it's useful for this, and here's the big problem, and here's the general context in which it falls. So all of these could actually work depending on the context. So you should be ready to be innovative and creative about how you can uh, deliver your talk. Recovery is extremely important because something might go wrong. So basically you start your Zoom presentation in a couple of weeks, uh, you know, things might not work or you might not have the right slides or, you know, someone's really asking a lot of annoying questions or someone's making a lot of noise or eating or something or someone's getting ready to leave, or talk time is cut short uh, because a major VIP is leaving, or maybe you start with the wrong slide deck, or maybe all the, the fonts are off. Some of my fonts were off. Did I stop and say, oh no, gosh, let me fix this. I just went on. That doesn't matter, you guys still get it. So you should be able to sort of figure it out and address it, and that's sort of extremely important because it conveys your general confidence and makes everybody happier uh, in the end. So again, some common storyboards are first, you have the problem and the solution, or you have a technology and the application, or you have some trends and a merger of trends, or uh, sort of what I was just suggesting earlier, for every paragraph, you start with, we did it, and then here's how we did it. Or you can talk about the past and what are we doing now and the future, or what is and what can be, or start with something simple, go on to something complex, and to carry out. So basically, in general, good storyboards flow logically well, the material is set up properly and minimally. Basically, if you spend five of your seven minutes on background, you're not using your time effectively. And maybe by the fourth minute of background, I've now started looking at my phone because I knew all that already. The takeaway is highlighting on a payload position. You have an ordering that you naturally can recall. Don't be creative to the point that you forget the ordering. You're like, uh, actually, uh, you grab the interest, you sustain the interest and the momentum, and you also match the audience. So you can build your own storyboard by assembling ideas, developing these ideas, storyboarding, chunking them together, forming a story, and then you know, uh, saving additional things for the beginning or the ending. And you can optimize that flow by you know, either 
uh, skipping some things or reordering some things. And you should also ask what has changed every time you do that. And what did you learn? How well does it work? And you know, is the thing better now? So that's planning your token storyboarding. And then the next item is how to convince people because everything we do has to do with convincing somebody that what we just said is actually real. So you can do that when preparing by determining the message, creating the story, using a narrative and working on your slides, planning the boardwalk and the storyboard and then anticipating problems and determining the introduction, the conclusion. When practicing, avoid memorizing because we can tell if you've memorized. Instead, you should speak impromptu. You should practice piecemeal and you re should re-storyboard. Don't start from the beginning every single time because then the beginning will be awesome and the end will be sort of sketchy. And you should re-storyboard every time you practice. You should be like, oh, maybe I, I can sort of shuffle these lines around. And then when presenting, do not regurgitate. Have a minimum number of points on the bullet point uh, so that you can speak around them rather than just simply reading a very long sentence that wraps around the line and then continues and so on and so forth. You have to interact with the slides on the board. You have to take an interest in your audience. You have to modify the jargon to sort of actually speak more clearly. Buy them time, use verbal punctuation, use visual punctuation, and then control the focus of your audience. The three elements of ancient Greek rhetoric are logos, ethos, and pathos. Logos is the reason, the logic, the proof. That's what most of the people focus on. And that's, of course, if you don't have that, you know, you shouldn't be giving a talk. The logo should be there. The technical part should be there. That's the structure of the speech. That's the reference to studies, statistics, case studies, comparisons, analogies, metaphors. That's the stuff that you've done. Ethos is your credibility and your trust. And the main techniques here are your personal branding, your confidence in the delivery, and the fact that you're citing credible sources. Your pathos is the emotions. So for example, you've just made a new drug Talk about that patient who's in the hospital and the doctor is taking care of them and you know you don't know whether they're gonna survive or not, etc. Get people's emotions flowing and then you know you can add some inspirational quotes, you can add some vivid language before then delivering on that. So be ready, not at every single slide, but be ready throughout your talk to basically combine all three. So basically the emotions, the trust and credibility, and also the technical and reasoning. And then lastly, connecting with your audience and achieving your goals and matching them. It's not about you, it's about them. Help them appreciate your technical contribution. Give them the intuition that they need rather than focusing on why you spent three months getting that parameter. They might not care. Care about them, not about you. Break any rule as long as they're helped, they're not bothered. By the end of the intro, they should know the overall direction of your talk. By the end of the intro, they should understand your title. You should cover everything on your slide. If it's not important, don't put it there. If it's important, put it and cover it. And what you say should be consistent with what's on the slide. You can't say, oh, you know, this dropped when in fact it's rising on the slide. Don't tell them anything they won't need later because then they'll be busy remembering something and then if it'll never come, they'll be a little upset at you or they might just not pay attention to what you're giving them because they're expecting something else. Tell them what they need to know before they need it. So order it in a way that they have what they need and both verbally and non-verbally, help them parse what is actually important in the talk. And the more time you spend, the more important it is. The more time you repeat, the more important it is. So take the important things, spend more time on them, and repeat them more often. And you tie everything together with a sense of finality, and be memorable, be creative, be different, teach them something. At the beginning of your talk, most people should be able to understand it. The general public should be able to understand everything. Your family should be understanding, able to understand anything. High school students should be able to understand everything. And then as you move up to MIT students, people in other technical disciplines, people in your discipline and the people in your group, that's when most of the payload starts happening, okay? So this is the hardcore technical details for how something works. But everyone should understand this. Even if they don't understand everything here, more and more people should be able to understand that. And then, you know, eventually some, things only the expert will understand it. That's fine. So this is the why, this is the what, this is the how. And the how specifically, it's okay if they don't understand it, but they should understand the how, the general how, and of course, the so what. Everybody with me on this? So again, sometimes people water down their talks too much. There's no payload, nothing technical. No, no excitement there. 
Sometimes they have too much jargon, too complex, too confusing, too technical. The jumps are too big. There's many misunderstandings. And, you know, sometimes there's no interaction or a poor storyboard or a poor setup. What is the problem? What is the solution? What is the intuition? Okay, and so what? So that's what you should be focusing on. Basically, problem, solution, intuition, and so what should be understood by everyone. And then this part, it's okay if it's harder, but it should still be there. You can't have a payload-free uh, rocket going on space. So the take-homes are delivery, recovery, and credibility, goals, and visibility. So you have to master your delivery, genuinely care, give the stuff that's most interesting to walk to watch, make eye contact, make a connection, gesture, use space appropriately, use facial expression, posture, volume, word choice to capture all these things. Minimize the amount of surprises, anticipate the questions and the problems area, visit the room beforehand, upload your slides, name the files appropriately, etc. And then you build credibility. You built it up before to get in the door and when you're in, you have to sustain it. You focus on your goals and then you gain visibility, not just who knows you, but uh, not, not just who you know, but who knows you. Take ownership, ask good questions at a conference, be the one they go to, pay special attention to detail. Take credit when appropriate, but give credit when necessary, uh, and also when appropriate. And take the initiative, present your own ideas, give a better presentation, and differentiate yourselves. Because if all you do is sit in the background, you know, make awesome research and have someone else in your group present it, you're not gonna go far. You're not gonna be able to achieve all the things that you could achieve to make a difference in the world. You won't be able to contribute as much. So you have to have the right balance uh, there. All right, so <laughs> we're a little over time, but uh, this again was an optional lecture. This is just dump loading, uh, you know, core dump loading something advice on you guys. Um, use it to best you see fit. This is really to help you, uh, not just in your final presentation for this course, but throughout your career, uh, both in, preparing your paper, organizing your ideas, preparing your, visual, your figures, your visuals, uh, using that to best you can, and also delivering uh, to best you can. Who feels that they've learned something today? Yes? Awesome. Good. And that was it. This is the last lecture. The next lectures, uh, you're working your projects on Thursday, you're working on projects next Tuesday, and then you're giving the next final lectures with the frontiers of the field, which is basically you guys. Sounds good? Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Sorry for running a little over. Um, bye. Good luck on your projects. Uh, don't, don't hesitate to uh, text the, the, the chat, the, the whole class. Awesome. So the class, again, was 6UAT, if you want to learn more about all of that. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.